Hi, I'm Dennis Sylvester from the University of Michigan, and this talk intends to introduce you to the topic of ultra-low power design. This is an emerging area of interest in IC design today. So why are we talking about ultra-low power, and why are we talking about it now? Uh, it's actually the confluence of several trends. Um, as you may have heard, the Internet of Things, or IoT, is the newest emerging driver in the semiconductor industry. In addition, Gordon Bell's law from 1971 calls for a new smaller computing class each decade. This is shown in the plot on this slide. Specifically, the upcoming computing class will supplement smartphones and related devices of the past decade. These new microsystems will sell at higher volumes and lower costs, along with being much smaller than the previous computing class. Because the new devices will be small, they will necessarily consume very little power. I will further detail this in the next slide. Taking these trends together, uh, we expect wireless sensing systems with severely limited power budgets to proliferate in the coming decade. So let's use this slide to help define the U in ULP, namely, how low power are we really talking? Uh, here we quantify the expected power budgets in very small sensing systems. In the plot at right, we have average power budget uh, in log scale on the y-axis and the lifetime of the system, again in log scale, on the x-axis. Um, and there are four curves shown. Uh, each using different energy sources ranging from conventional large uh, AA batteries as shown on the left uh, down to one square millimeter thin film lithium batteries, very tiny batteries uh, in blue. And so the typical units of time are annotated here to help give you an idea of, of how long we're talking about. So given the small size of these future microsystems, the bottom one or two curves are really the most representative and they show that the average power demand for reasonable lifetime between uh, recharging needs to be below a microwatt and often down into the tens or hundred nanowatt range. So this places severe constraints on the underlying circuits in the system. Finally, note that energy harvesting is an important part of these future ultra-low power systems uh, as it enables seamless recharging of the batteries to enable years and beyond type of lifetimes. Uh, however, the smaller volume also limits the harvestable power. So millimeter scale to centimeter scale harvesting um, uh, harvesters often yield only nanowatt type power levels. And that depends on the harvesting modality and environmental conditions. So at this point, we've kind of painted a grim picture uh, with very ex uh, extreme uh, power constraints. Uh, they may even sound unreasonable to many seasoned designers. However, circuit design researchers have not been idle. Um, these two plots here show recent progress in the energy efficiency of two uh, critical blocks uh, from the literature. So the left plot shows uh, data drawn from Professor uh, Boris Merman's uh, ADC survey online and shows that data converters have seen a, a order of magnitude improvement in energy efficiency uh, approximately every six years over the last uh, 15 to 18 years. Uh, on the right, although there is less data here, uh, there's a clear downward trend in energy per bit for radios of various types as well. Um, so meanwhile, we know that battery technology has improved very slowly. And if you look at the efficiency of, of harvesting techniques themselves, say photovoltaics, uh, they have fundamental limits and we're quite close to those. Uh, so as a result, the conclusion here at the bottom really is that the most likely path toward achieving complete systems that consume nanowatts is really through innovative circuit design. So to reduce energy or power consumption, it's well known that reducing supply voltage, VDD, is the most effective approach, particularly for digital systems. Specifically focusing on energy in the left plot, uh, we separate dynamic energy, which is governed by CV squared, uh, and leakage or static energy, uh, which is the static power of the system multiplied by the time taken to perform a task or for a given clock cycle. Uh, total energy here is shown in blue, and as you can see, it reduces quite nicely. This is a log linear plot uh, as we move voltage down from a typical value of, let's say, 0.9 or 1 volt. However, once you get down to very low voltages, something really interesting happens. 
So what happens here is that once the supply voltage approaches the threshold voltage of the devices, the time it takes to perform a given task grows exponentially as shown in the right plot here where it gets very steep. So what this means is that the static energy will start to grow rapidly down here and uh, eventually the total energy will reach a minimum point at V opt. Okay? And so this V opt value depends on things like circuit activity and technology among other things. So the takeaway here is that reducing supply voltage is very helpful and is a key part of most ultra low power systems. However, reducing it too far is counterproductive in terms of both energy efficiency and also performance. So there are other issues such as variability that also arise I'll mention later. So finally, in digital systems, a good rule of thumb is that it's typically best to operate about 100 to 200 millivolts above threshold voltage to balance all of these concerns. So now we take a look at a generic wireless sensing system or microsystem here. Because power is a cumulative metric, we need to achieve ultra low power in each component or else one single component will end up dominating the total system power budget. So here I list a few particularly critical components uh, that are challenging to design in the ultra low power space. First, any component that cannot be power gated sets a lower bound on average power consumption. This includes voltage references and timers among other things. Secondly, power management unit or PMU has to perform up conversion from a harvester to charge a battery, down conversion to provide a lower supply to digital blocks, and so on. When in standby mode, the PMU load at the output is very small, and that makes it difficult to efficiently perform these tasks. Third, digital blocks such as processors and memories do use aggressive voltage scaling as I just described. Embedded non-volatile memories though cannot easily do this and they often are a major power bottleneck in these wireless systems. Fortunately, there has been substantial progress in reducing power of all these building blocks over the past say five to seven years, but more work is needed. So quickly I'll talk about just a couple of kind of breakthroughs in the ultra low power space that are helping uh, progress. First is, uh, is this two transistor voltage reference that has found use in power management units, biasing of amplifiers, low power timers, and other always on settings. Uh, prior work in voltage reference includes both band gap and threshold voltage based uh, references, and they tended to consume 50 nanowatts to a microwatt in power, which would completely use up the power budget of the systems that we're targeting. This simple design offers small area, ease of design, technology portability, as well as picowatt level power consumption. The design relies on two sub-threshold biased transistors, and by sizing the two devices, we can achieve a low temperature coefficient, as shown in the bottom. So the overall performance of this reference is actually quite comparable to much higher power designs, and there are several more recent variants of this design that reduce process sensitivity by trading off design simplicity. So more broadly speaking, the use of sub-threshold bias transistors in analog circuits is very effective in reducing its power, uh, such as in low bandwidth amplifiers and other uh, slow settings. Another key component is the wireless communication block. Uh, RF communication is very expensive energy-wise, and time spent on a sensor node with the receiver on should be minimized. One recent approach is to use a poor sensitivity, very low power radio to listen for a wake-up signal. Uh, upon receiving the signal, a higher power transceiver can be turned on to perform the main communication tasks. These so-called wake-up radios are always on and therefore must be very low power, but until recently, their power was still in the 10 microwatt type range. Uh, the design at the bottom was published a few years ago and helped break through this 10 microwatt floor, demonstrating about 100 nanowatt uh, wake-up radio performance. So the design uses things like near-threshold supply voltages for digital blocks, a very low power clock source, but more importantly it replaces the LNA, which provides RF gain, with passive RF rectifier. In general, the lowest power wake-up radios, as shown here in this, in this plot, down these three or four designs, all tend to rely on passive RF front ends. Now this leads to more difficulty in recovering the signal uh, as it requires substantial interference rejection and, and heavy duty correlation. However, these can be done in the digital domain with voltage scaling to achieve ultra low power. So we've looked at a couple of ultra low power building blocks. I want to keep in mind that the power consumption at the system level is what really matters. Here's a simple example of why over-optimizing each component can be wasteful. 
Consider a case where sense data is digitized by an ADC and then operated on by a low power microcontroller such as an ARM Cortex M0. At the left here, again, we're replotting the data from the Merman survey on ADCs, uh, and this time showing resolution along the x axis and energy uh, on the y axis here. Okay. Um, the right bar chart, uh, chart plots total energy for a single conversion for a range of resolutions. Now, if depending on the resolution, 8, 9, or 10 bits, now what you can see is that once we actually do an operation, even five M0 instructions on the data that we've acquired, very rapidly the digital uh, power or energy in this case uh, overwhelms the acquisition uh, energy. So what we need to think about here is to be aware of the energy breakdown in your targeted system and application and optimize accordingly. So here is a relatively long list of other challenges that ultra low power designers must face in creating ICs and microsystems that are 10x or more lower power than conventional designs. For instance, variability in very low voltage digital is quite bad. Uh, and, and it's not as bad at near threshold as sub threshold, but it's still worse than at typical voltages. So it's always something to have in the back of your mind. Uh, we've encountered uh, issues where the models from foundries for things like body currents um, are inaccurate at the picowatt level. When you're designing at picowatts and nanowatts, these, these currents make a big difference, especially at things like high temperatures. Uh, so this uh, leads to the need for foundry interaction for better models at the picowatt or picoamp level. Uh, small batteries that are used in these systems have very high internal resistances, which means their peak output current is very low. So this is bad for things like RF, uh, when you have very high peak currents when you want to transmit data, or other bursty type operation. It means you need capacitances for these types of tasks, and we also have to keep them small because of the overall area, so it's a, it's a constraint. Uh, technology scaling typically provides low dynamic energy because of the smaller capacitances, but with much higher leakage. Uh, however, even with power gating, this can lead to too high of a leakage or standby mode power. So what we really want is scaled devices with small capacitances with options for ultra-low leakage uh, transistors in the same process. And uh, harvesting, uh, we mentioned earlier, it's very popular, uh, but if you look at a lot of the work in harvesting, it focuses on uh, higher input power levels. Harvesting at input power levels of nanowatts or even below nanowatts, say indoor photovoltaic harvesting, uh, is very challenging, and this is something that needs more uh, work. Despite all of these issues, there is uh, progress in complete nanowatt level ultra low power microsystems as shown in the figure uh, at bottom. So to summarize, ultra low power design spans all different subfields really of IC design, um, digital, analog, mixed signal, RF. Uh, common tools or weapons that we can use across these fields uh, include low voltage operation or sub-threshold bias transistors for analog to help bring power levels way, way down. Another important takeaway is to realize that uh, unlike timing or performance, power or energy has this cumulative property and therefore uh, any component can dominate the energy budget. So um, I call this the whack-a-mole strategy where if you reduce the power of one component, quickly another component becomes dominant. So we need to be able to optimize the whole thing as I talked about earlier. Furthermore, I should emphasize that it's very difficult to magically design a circuit, say a voltage reference or timer or harvester, that is an order of magnitude or, or two orders of magnitude lower power than previous designs with no trade-offs at all. Usually there's some other metrics such as area, noise, or something like that that must be sacrificed. So choosing which parameter to trade off depends on the final system requirements and that has to be kept in mind. Finally, we can look to our technology colleagues to optimize some trailing edge processes for ultra low power. This is already happening, uh, but desirable properties that we would look for as a ULP designer include extremely low leakage device flavors, reduced mismatch uh, from RDF or random dopant fluctuation, uh, higher body bias coefficients so we can use that knob to uh, perform variability compensation, uh, dense MIM caps and other things like that. So I hope I have piqued your interest in ultra-low power IC design. Thank you very much.